So to tell you about Eric, uh, Eric, who's fabulous, we are to having a conversation tonight. We are with the uh, acclaimed artist, Eric Fitzpatrick, talking about the acclaimed artist, Walter Biggs. It's perfect Thank combination. Um, Eric, it's hard to believe your, your professional career has spanned 40 years. That's very hard to believe, but the part that you're well-known and widely respected fine artist, that's not a surprise at all. Um, right. you, you work in oils, you work in watercolors, acrylics, pastels, and sculpture, including that marvelous sculpture on the ceiling that you, uh, that you yes. showed us earlier. Let me, uh, I'll tilt it up while you're talking about that so folks can see that. That's the ceiling. I love it. I love it. Um, He's been an adjunct professor for Virginia Tech and at Hollins, has taught painting and drawing repeatedly in Italy's Tuscany region for the University of Georgia abroad. That must have been incredible. Oh, it was the greatest job in the world. <laughs> I was so lucky. I feel so sorry for you. So sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> His travels, life, and work have been the subject of various TV programs, including video documentaries by Washington and Lee University and Blue Ridge Public Television. Fitzpatrick's paintings can be found in corporate and private collections in over 17 countries around the world. Thank quite, you, Fran. Quite remarkable. So I'm going to start the screen share, and I've got my fingers sure. crossed that I can keep, uh, keep everything going. Yeah. And, and thank you very much for the kind intro. And let me just tell folks what we're going to try to do here as, as we see uh, a great photo of Biggs there. Thank you. Um, all of you friends uh, are just like me, I take it. We're all big fans of Walter Biggs, and he's deserving of our adulation. The man was so, so talented. And as you probably know about his background, Walter was in New York in the golden age of illustration. It was That was the early 1900s. And he studied with Robert Henry, and Henry pretty much wrote the book uh, that artists still, I mean, I have a copy of that thing right here. Artists still consider that the Bible for painters. And there was Walter in that class. And beside him was Edward Hopper, George Bellows, Rockwell Kent, all who would be just fabulously famous, strong, strong American painters. So he was holding his own with all those guys. He was, he was very big time. But when you think about illustration, a lot of these guys were doing that, you know, to make ends meet and their fine art on the side. And illustration was great training for someone like Walter Biggs because you have to be fast. Uh, at first, you didn't have to be as fast. In the early days of illustration, you could do an oil, you could take your time, but it evolved quickly so that they had to end up working in gouache, which is an opaque watercolor, so that they could hit the deadlines. So you had to be fast and to the point. You had to be a good storyteller. But what Biggs brought to it was he was very good at fine art. And he let that infuse his work with more style and more paint quality than you usually see in illustration. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the fine art side of Walter Biggs, how he constructed paintings. And we're going to concentrate on three things. One is the geometry of his designs. That's the substructure under his subjects. Uh, the contrast he used, the light and dark contrast, the color contrast he used to guide us around. And third, how he actually did guide us around, what he wanted us to see first, second, and third in a painting. Uh, good artists like Biggs could control um, the viewer in the sense that uh, he, he knew exactly where he wanted you to go and he was gonna take you through that painting in a certain progression. So anyway, Fran, if you want to flash up a painting, we'll start talking about one okay. in particular. Well, actually, I had, I had a little bit more bio. Um, oh, excuse me. Go for it. Go for it. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. I, I didn't have what you just had, so that was wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah. Just wanted to give a, a, a little bit of, of grounding about Biggs. Uh, born sure. in Elliston, Virginia in 1886, moved to Salem when he was 12. Uh, he started in pen and ink and enrolled in Virginia Tech. Uh, as a freshman, his parents wanted him to be an engineer, and uh, he was uh, uh, spent his semester on campus uh, sketching his classmates and, and various campus scenes. So he came home, uh, persuaded his parents to let him go to New York, uh, and, and to, to uh, en enroll in the in the New York uh, School of Art. 
Um, so he studied with, with all of these incredible artists that you, you just mentioned um, and began within the, the first year in New York, he began um, doing illustrations for Young's Magazine and, and Field and Stream. And his uh, career in New York just really took off. Um, got you a couple of different pictures. So in 1921, he built a studio wow. behind his mother's house so that he'd have a place to work when he came home to Salem. He, well, he employed professional models in New York. Uh, when he was in Salem, he preferred to use, he used friends and family. So his, his mother and his sister appear in, in some of his work. But he did use professional models in New York. Um, and this is Mildred uh, Armstrong, who he married in 1923. Um, but he was uh, more married to his work. Um, and they uh, divorced uh, 14 years later. But she appears in a number of his illustrations. And we have a marvelous one of, of a perfume illustration that, that clearly uh, it's, it's her. Um, Big's reputation continued to grow. By 1940, he'd become a household name. He had constant commissions from the most popular publications of the day, Harper's Weekly, Ladies Home Journal, Cosmopolitan, Vogue, and the Saturday Evening Post. In the 50s, he moved back to Salem permanently, lived in his childhood home with Lucy, his friend, his sister, and also his closest friend. During this period, he focused on scenes around Salem, creating many paintings of the African-American Water Street community. He also painted scenes around Roanoke College and became artist in residence while he was there. Over his long career, Biggs won numerous prizes, received awards from six of the largest art associations in the country, including the National Academy of Design and the American Watercolor Society. In 1963, Biggs was inducted into the Illustrator Society Hall of Fame, along with another name that you know, and that would be uh, Norman Rockwell. Biggs was an artist, a practicing artist until his very last day. He created uh, abstract sketches in the hours just before his death, February the 11th, 1968. So here at the Salem Museum, we have 13 original Biggs works now on display, uh, plus a number of reproductions to more fully explore the scope of his work. Uh, we're very recently, it's undergone a facelift. It looks wonderful in there, thanks to Peggy Shiflett, who has given it a, a fresh coat of paint, and uh, the, the paintings just really stand out now. Um, and we've had an intern, Anna Elmore, who has redesigned the space, reconfigured the space, and added a lot of new interpretation. So uh, it's, uh, if you've seen it before, um, it's different. And, uh, and after tonight, you'll see uh, the two new paintings that we will unveil. And I'm, I'm just really excited about that. So we're going to start um, with the, the first painting. It was a painting that uh, Eric mentioned while we were, while we were chatting. Um, I got one more picture of, of, uh, of, of Walter Biggs. Um, uh, Eric has, has fascinated me because he's, he has visited the museum on any number of occasions to just sit in front of, a, of one of Big's works for maybe a half an hour. And I've just been dying to know what he's, <laughs> thinking, what he's thinking, what is, what is, what is speaking to him in, in this work. So I'm really grateful to Eric for being willing uh, to, to talk with us tonight and to, to talk about uh, the paintings that he sees. So the first one that he mentioned, um, is uh, one called the, the dining room scene. Um, it's a watercolor. Let me get that up there. 22 inches wide by 18 inches tall. The work depicts the Biggs family at their home on Boulevard. His father had died in 1905 when Biggs was 19, but his mother, Annie Southall Biggs, his sister Lucy and Biggs himself lived well into the 1950s. In their household, Walter was known simply as son or brother while Lucy was known as sister. Brother and sister were close friends throughout their lives. In the late 1950s, a fire at the family home in Salem inspired Biggs to move home to care for Lucy. So Eric, yes, what, do you, Fran. what do you see? Let's talk about it. Well, first let's talk about the center of interest. Um, he's so smart. You know, when you squint at a painting, usually the, the most contrast you see is where your eye goes first. 
So we're, we're glancing off his shoulder and going straight to Miss Lucy there. Miss Lucy is the center of interest for two reasons. One is she has on a pinkish blouse and that is very close to a window that is green. Now, red and green uh, are opposite on the color wheel. So anytime you're gonna put any opposites near each other, they will sort of attract our eye and our eye will just dance between them, not knowing what to do. The closer you get them to each other, the more intense the colors, the more fight there will be and the, the more irresistible it is to the eye. Uh, so that is one way he controls where we go first. Miss Lucy's blouse is irresistible and we have to go to it. The second is the contrast formed by her head, her black hair and Walter's body and hair across from her. We, we almost imagine a conversation between the two because he's riveted us between those two by making them dark, uh, his, his body and, and hair and her hair. Uh, so again, the way an artist is gonna rivet you to a center of interest is contrast, either light or dark contrast or color contrast. He has both working simultaneously here. Very skillful. Now, this is a watercolor, as you said, Fran, which means that any white in it is usually the white of the paper. So look how skillfully he has put in the tablecloth. That's not paint. That is the white of the paper. Now he's put some very pale washes on it to represent folds and the drapery of it. But that's basically the white of the paper showing through. He's painted everything but the tablecloth. Uh, that takes a lot of skill. You really have to think uh, really ahead a lot to do that in, in a watercolor. Let's talk compositionally about it too, because I think it's brilliant. And what he's done here, he has drawn an X composition. And what I mean by that is there is an imaginary diagonal running from the lower left corner where that chair is, up to the top right corner where that landscape is. That's why that landscape has a slant to it. And that slant is agreeing with the imaginal, imaginary diagonal. There's also an imaginary diagonal that's going from the upper left down to Big's shoulder, because that's Big's right there. And the tablecloth is where it really shows a lot. The jagged edge of the tablecloth, where the cursor is right now, is the most, uh, is the biggest clue to you that he's drawn that diagonal. Now, being a very smart man, he's not going to telegraph his moves to you. He's not going to make things all along those diagonals. He's going to give you partial uh, things that line up along those two diagonals to form that X. But the, the reason it's brilliant is because it is partial. If he had lined things up totally on both diagonals, it would be so static you would find it very boring. But he just emphasizes parts of both diagonals and that's what keeps it sort of in motion. And right before we went on uh, air here, Fran and I were talking about the left-hand edge of the Oriental rug. If you look at that over there, past her chair, yes, right there, look how that rises up. It's not realistic to the baseboard behind it. It rises up in space and would hit that baseboard, what, 12 inches above it, something like that. It doesn't matter because he is making his own rules in this imaginary world, and that's what artists do. And just so he has pulled it off with such panache that we never notice it, then it's fine, and that's what he did. So I think it's a masterful work, and. Uh, Biggs was a masterful artist, obviously. The one other thing I'd say about it, watercolor, for those of you who have done it, you know how difficult it is. You also know it's an additive medium. It's light to dark. In other words, the darkest thing you see, which is under the tablecloth, was put on the very last. Everything had to be taken very gradually down until then. So usually watercolor starts with a very big brush and it ends up with a very small brush. It usually starts very light and it ends up very dark. So you can imagine his moves moving through that painting as he created it. It's, it's a watercolor by a master, I'll tell you that. It doesn't get any better than what you're looking at right now. And that's it for that one, I guess. All right. This one is a water street scene. It is watercolor on canvas, uh, 29 inches wide, 21 inches high. This painting shows the corner of Calhoun and water streets in Salem. Bethel Methodist Church that once stood there is visible in the background. Water Street was Salem's most prominent black community during segregation and was one of Big's favorite scenes in Salem to paint. That's a great painting. It might be my favorite in your collection, 
uh, upon reflection here because I think it's just so intelligent and so well done. There's not a whole lot of color there. It's almost what we call monochromatic, which is taking one color and adding black to it, adding white to it, and letting, uh, you know, just sort of exist in that one area of the color wheel. But when you look at it compositionally, he's done something that's just brilliant. Look at the edges of the house. If both edges were given to you in equal strength, it would look like goalposts. You couldn't get past it. So what he's done is wrap that tree in a curvilinear fashion over that line. He, he does an S curve over the line of the edge of the house, and that makes it have motion in a wonderful way. So we have the motion going off the tree. We know that that's where he wants our attention because the tree is the first thing that jumps out. It's the darkest thing. But he is wise enough not to make it the only thing. This isn't a one trick pony. Biggs is so wise, he's gonna pull us off to the edge, past that tree, and if you look on the balcony, there's a little bit of green, a little bit of red, the same opposites he used in the dining room to take our attention over there. I think that's the mark of a great artist. Little accents. Winslow Homer would do that. He'd give you a seascape and everything would be earth and sky. And he'd put a red dash over on the horizon somewhere to the side just to keep you moving around the painting. So one of the interesting things in this one in particular is the staircase coming down from that balcony. If you look at the staircase, it's very partial. All the stairs are not there. It doesn't even make its way to the bottom. That again is the mark of a good artist. Degas would do that with his dancers at times. He'd give you the top half of one and not the bottom half just to make it more interesting. We know the stairs go to the bottom. He doesn't need to tell us that. And so every stair is not in place. This isn't photography. And Picasso had a great quote about painting and photography. Once the camera was invented, the artist knew for the first time what he was not. Biggs realizes this. He knows you don't have to have detail in everything. So he gives us just what he wants us to see to keep the romance in it. You notice the people in the doorway and the people out in front of the church are very minimally put in. He doesn't want our attention with them too much or he would have given them more color and contrast. He wants us on the left side of this painting. And yet just to echo that roof line, the peak of the roof, he has the church back there and the steeple. Um, he's he's re repeating shapes in a wonderful way that gives it a rhythm. So again, very intelligent design. My gracious, the man's just, uh, he's teaching us with every painting uh, what a master does, how he thinks, and it's just a pleasure to see this thing. You notice the loose drawing underneath it. Uh, we, we know the architecture is, is there, but it's not picky. It's not done with a T-square. It's done gesturally. Biggs was a master of gesture, and that line just keeps moving and keeps us fascinated. He could draw any subject in the world he wanted and make it interesting to us because his language, his visual language with which he depicted these things was just so fascinating and sophisticated in itself. So that's it for that one, I think. Unless you want to say something else, Fran, anything else to say there? Okay. No, and I, I always see more things after you, you've described them. Well, to be honest, I see different things every time I look at it. There's so much to see in a Biggs painting. And, you know, I think really good painters are like master chess players. You don't realize all the moves they're making. They're so subtle. And when you put it all together and realize it, uh, it's just totally amazing. And you see different things all the time. He's, he's a puzzle maker. And the puzzle lends itself to you. If you will sit in front of that painting for long enough, all of a sudden it starts to talk to you. Like, oh, he did this, he did that. How smart a move that was. So that to me is the true joy of, of, of sitting in front of uh, a painter like Biggs and deciphering what he was doing. It sort of lets you know his mental process. And you can see the man was flat out brilliant. So let's go to the next one, which is one of my favorites too. Tell us about that one, Fran, will you? This one is Gospel Meeting. Um, originally, it was an oil, but uh, what we have is a, is a reproduction of it. Um, and this is a, a copy of one of Big's famous illustrations. The original is owned by the Illustration House in Norwalk, Connecticut. Oh, it's a beauty. First off, first off we have to give him uh, a lot of credit because most artists do not tackle the human figure. It's the hardest thing in the art world. And that's why all of us spend hours, 
years in life drawing. We don't like to do it, but we know we need to do it to depict the human figure with any sort of believability. Well, Biggs was a master. He didn't avoid the figure at all. And he would have models in and he'd sketch a few of them and then he would send them away. And he would go ahead and develop the composition with no models around and then he would call them back in after everything was sort of delineated and figured out. And then he put the finishing strokes on it, which tells you where he was coming from. Fine art meant more than illustration to him. But look at the lean in this. It's such a rhythm set up by the leaning of all these figures. And again, if you squint at it, the center of interest is the woman with her hands up. And yet he's so skillfully united her dress, the white dress of the vertical woman there, with the shirt of the man who's on the front row, with the dress of the woman who's beside him. So it becomes one flowing shape. Now, if he had sealed off any of those shapes with an outline, say the outline of the woman's dress or of the man's shirt, your eye couldn't travel through. But that's where the fine art comes into it. Biggs was that good at keeping our eye moving and knowing how it would move. Now, the reason the woman in the white dress standing is the center of interest is because she is the biggest unbroken patch of paint where everything else has detail or shadows or it's smaller on the page. She's the biggest thing. He also points right to it. Now, look on the right hand side of that at the podium where the Bible is resting. It's coming in midway up on the right, and it's pointing right at that center of interest, so we cannot miss her. And that's a very subtle X movement too, because she's leaning one way, everybody in the room is leaning one way, and the podium is going the other way, the pulpit. That's just great design. And the fact that we can see the edge, the black edge of the preacher's cloak on the right-hand side as well, he wasn't going to end with a straight line on that edge of the painting. He was going to bring that slant in there to keep the motion going, keep the lean going. But look at those faces. He also captured emotion. It's not as if he's only a good draftsman. He has empathy. I guarantee you he sat in, down and had that pose in himself. He probably acted out a couple of times for every figure so he could understand them better. Artists do that. Uh, you're trying to understand emotionally what's going on. If you read uh, Leonardo's uh, biography, they talk about Leonardo da Vinci imagining conversations between all his characters. They had to have a believability. They had to have an interaction. I'm sure Biggs was thinking the same way from what we see here. Uh, this is a heck of a painting. And, and to do multiple figures with that much motion and to bring it off with such bravado and style, uh, it's just an incredible painting. So again, he shows us his mastery. Uh, in a very different way. This time it's all about motion, but he's obviously, he can do it all. So there you go. I guess that's about all I have to say about that one, but I'm just in awe and he's the man. That's all I can say. This brings us to war news. It's a watercolor, 29 inches wide by 21 inches high. This painting depicting a black family sitting on their front porch while well, a young boy plays with a toy gun, received a gold medal award from the American Watercolor Society. Arthur and, er and artist Ernest Watson described Bick's depictions of African Americans to be full of dignity and humanity and free from caricature or negative implications. This is a heck of a painting, and this is one of my favorites in your collection too, Fran. It is a masterwork. Mm -hmm. This one, we can really see the geometry that Biggs planned his paintings with. Uh, he has two major things going on in this painting. One is a pyramid, and we'll talk about that in a second. The other is a W shape, and we will talk about that as well. Let's go back to the central figure. The first thing you see, the woman in the white dress, seated, the one in the white dress standing, and that red dash right in between them. It's irresistible. Good golly day, you can't turn away from it because it's such a dash of cadmium red. It's pure out of the tube, not diluted at all. That's there because he wants to cement you right into that lady who is the center of the whole thing. The reason it works is because there's so many greens on the periphery of the composition. You're almost looking at a, a bullseye on a target because Biggs has set you up that way. Everything is green or blue-green or yellow-green. 
and all of a sudden there's that cadmium red, absolutely irresistible. Let's talk about the pyramid he's working with here. Now the pyramid, the woman who's seated in white, if we go up her shoulder and we continue on to the standing woman and we take a turn down right there and come down the other side and it's going to come down almost the back of that uh, child in yellow there and the other child in a white blouse. And then the bottom of the pyramid is the child holding the gun in yellow. Look at the way that horizontal moves across the seal off the bottom of that pyramid. It's also a weightier thing. If you look, if you squint at the picture, there's a, the pyramid shape, uh, which is a broad shape going across the bottom there for a while. It's much more weighty than the, the upper shape with the whites of the dresses there. Let's talk about the W shape too, because this is fascinating. The gentleman over on the port swing to our left, who's reading the paper, he becomes the start of the W. And if we follow that slant down, and then back up through the woman in white, seated, the woman in white standing, back down through the American flag on the mailbox, and then back up in the curtains of the window, we've seen a big W shape. He has used this elsewhere. We're gonna see this later in a church painting that, that's an oil that we'll talk about. But that's uh, a great designer at work, and we're not even talking about the subject matter. The subject matter is emotional, it's very poignant, and yet um, we all see that readily. I think if we have hearts, we, we can empathize with Big's figure in his storytelling. So again, tonight we're concentrating on what lies underneath the actual uh, machinery of the painting that make it work so well. It's just sort of phenomenal how good he was and how easy he made it look. Now look, look how he would do something twice and not repeat himself. Look for a minute on the either side of that doorway at the windows, the panels going up. On one side, we have no panes on the left side. On the right side, we do. And yet he has not shown us three or four panes going all up to the ceiling. No, he's just keeping them lower. So the whole thing is lopsided to a degree, which he needed to do to offset that pyramid that was sort of predictable. He knows how to put weight on one thing and take it off of another. The same is done with the two vertical columns that are the porch. On one side, it's unbroken almost till he gets to the leaves on the ground. On the other side, he's not going to show us that much because it would be symmetrical. So he has the post box. He has the bamboo uh, curtain that's been let down there, the shade. So it becomes a much more broken shape. So anything that's going to be done twice that would be symmetrical, he's going to make it asymmetrical because asymmetry is more interesting to our eyes. So again, Biggs is pretty amazing and there he goes. He's, he's just incredible. He also, there's one echo of the pyramid we didn't talk about, the woman's legs in the white dress seated. Look at the way her legs are crossed. There's your pyramid. A lot of times artists will do this just to echo something, to give it resonance. So, uh, uh, you would read it in more places than one around the image. But it's a pretty phenomenal image. I think it's just a heck of a piece, one of his best. And I guess that's about all I have to say on that one, Fran, unless you have any comments or questions. So this one is Oma Randy. This is an illustration. Uh, it was an oil 24 inches wide by 33 inches tall. It's a very dark painting. It was given in memory of Henry Garden and Grace Celeste Tinsley Garden. Um, Biggs often painted his illustrations in black and gray and, and white when they were commissioned for, portrait, for uh, publications that were printed in black and white. This painting is part of a series of 16 illustrations created for a short story written in 1914 by Armistead Gordon, a short story entitled Amorandi. The character of Mirandi, also known as Aunt Miranda, returns to the plantation where she had been enslaved in order to help the family. Um, this particular scene depicts a confrontation between Miranda and Lucille, who is the young daughter of the new owners of the plantation. Thank you, Fran. Well, first up, there's no doubt where the center of interest is. 
Uh, Miranda is looking at that young woman and we do too, because she again is the largest unbroken shape. And she cuts a nice slant across the canvas there and we cannot resist going to look at her face and her emotion. That's what Biggs has done. He's directed us exactly where he wants to do. And then we go up, I think, and see the light on her shoulder or Miranda and start exploring her face. And uh, so we get into it gradually there, but it's a very subtle bit of slanting. Uh, it's almost an X composition as well, but it's an implied X again. The light through the window coming across on Miranda's shoulder, landing on that dress is one diagonal, and you can see the bed catching light too that completes the diagonal as it goes out uh, of the right and lower corner. The other X, uh, the other diagonal is just the, the girl's dress. It's not going corner to corner, it's just met over on the side there. So you can imagine those two imaginary diagonals intersecting at the center of interest. The fact that it doesn't have color, obviously, uh, as Fran said, was for the, the illustration, didn't require it. They were printing in black and white, so it didn't need to do it. But it also, I think it's a great example of the strength of the draftsmanship uh, that Biggs had without color. Now, there's some artists who depend on color, and they're, you know, some people who are called colorists don't have the draftsmanship, they don't have the design qualities, and they get by just on color. Uh, modern art, a lot of that is based on that. Uh, so this, again, is down to the basics, nuts and bolts, great draftsmanship, great design, without relying on color. And yet we know he's a great colorist, because we've seen that too. So... Again, his toolbox is very full. He has every tool any artist should ever have, and he knows how to use them all. For the golfers out there, it's like having a full bag of clubs, and he's an expert at everything from the driver to the putter and everything in between. The guy is as good as he gets. All right, let's go to the next one, Fran. All right, the next one is one of our two new works that we are so grateful and so excited to have. This first one, oops, I skipped one. Did Eric, you? Back up. Okay. <laughs> it's the letter. I'm so, I'm, I'm so excited about the new ones. The letter? I'm of myself. The letter. Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, I don't have that next on mine, but I'll try to, wait a minute. Uh, okay, we're on the same one with the woman on the porch. Right. The okay. Woman on the porch. I've got you. And that's Tom Watts. The model, is that correct? Uh, I think uh, who, who used to yes. model for Bates all the time. Watt Jones, yes. Well, Watt Jones, excuse me, that's right, that's right, Watt I had Jones. it wrong. Watt Jones, thank you very much, okay. So this one is oil, it's, it's one of the biggest that we own. Uh, it's 41 inches wide by 31 inches tall. This painting is undoubtedly an illustration, but it was never published and the context of the image is unknown. The man pictured is Watt Jones, who often modeled for Biggs in Salem and appears in many of his works. Jones was born a slave, lived in North Roanoke County, but during his long life, he fathered 22 children and was the subject of a poem by the famous British poet, John Drinkwater. Jones was believed to have died at the age of 114. So he must have been quite the character. He must have been, and what a, a long life. That's pretty amazing. Well, when we first look at this one, obviously we see color first, and this is a great example of Big's mastery of color. Uh, you can't look away from her dress, it's just too much. And, and why is it that way? Because the rose colors, the pinks, are surrounded mostly by greens in the rest of the canvas. So, uh, Mr. Watts looking at her is giving us the center of interest as well. Uh, he's directing our gaze right to her and to that letter, which is what it, the illustration was about. So I want you to look, though, for the shape underneath these things. Again, an artist would choose a shape for their illustration, and then they would align the things in the painting to meet the shape they have chosen. So what we're talking about here is an isosceles triangle. It's a straight thing that goes up to the man and comes down to the woman's back and her head. And if you draw that triangle, you can see exactly the composition George Bellows, who was his roommate. Uh, let's, let's stop and talk a bit about uh, that. Evidently, Biggs and George Bellows, who was a very famous American artist, were roommates. And Biggs happened to say to him one night, listen, there's a, there's a fight, a prize fight across the street. It's Sharky's. It's stag night over there. Why don't we go catch that fight? 
Well, one of the most famous masterworks that Bellows ever did was Stag and Sharkies. It wouldn't have been done without Walter Biggs taking Bellows across the street. But the, the composition in that, one boxer leaning into the other and hitting him very hard, well, that's an isosceles triangle. That's just exactly the composition we have here. They were obviously under the same teacher, Robert Henry, and he was teaching them how to put geometry under their paintings to make them very solid compositionally. The other thing I would tell you to pay attention to, as the man is standing there, he's almost bolt upright. That's a pretty harsh thing to put in a painting without breaking it up somewhat. So look what the table does with the blue fabric on it and his hat, the top hat in his hand with that blue dash on it. There's no accident that there's blue on both. They connect. And what he's done is cross out basically the vertical that would have been too dominant. And he's focused, he's given us another center of interest there. He obviously wants us to go first to the lady, second to the man, third to the cross there. It's almost a gun sight. Um, the man's cane runs into the table and down into the the table legs, and then the, the top of the table over to the top hat. Uh, those are an intersection that's sort of irresistible. So another very smart move uh, in the puzzle by Biggs to make this thing just so interesting. Your eye can travel around over and over and over and never get tired of exploring all of these wonderful shapes that he's put in there for us. So, um, I think that's about all in this one, but, but just glory in the color for a minute because shimmering light is really hard to get. And now Big saw the Armory show in New York. That was the big show at which American artists got introduced to Impressionism. And they say his palette shifted radically. And from then on, he was full of light. Um, Norman Rockwell said he was a poet, that his work showed great poetry. And I agree, you look at this, this is much more than an illustration. This is a painting. This is fine art at the same time. And that's a testament to the mastery of Biggs. Okay, Fran. Okay. Into our new one. Our first new one for the evening. This is wow. untitled. It is a snowy winter scene. It is watercolor, 28 inches wide by 19 inches high. It was donated to us. Uh, last fall, uh, and we are, are just now having the opportunity to, to unveil it. It was given to us by Philip Persinger in memory of his mother, Mildred Emery Persinger. This depiction of a snowy winter scene was given to us, given to the Persinger family by Biggs himself as a thank you for hosting him in their home. And we are also grateful to Evelyn Deegan, who uh, had this framed for us so that we could, could hang it and put it on display. That is one gorgeous, active watercolor. Um, those of you who have tried watercolor, you know how hard it is to do anything in it, uh, much less to do it dramatically and successfully. Look at the motion first from the mountains above. We almost have what looks like a breaking wave coming down on that house. He's made everything in motion so wonderfully. It would be very easy to put a constant line of the, of the Blue Ridge or Allegheny Mountains behind this thing. He doesn't do that, he breaks it up. There's some of it that's heavier than others. There's some of it's broken up entirely. So it's not continuous. It's a very sensuous way of putting in those mountains without overkill. Now let's look at the center of interest. Where does our eye go first? It goes straight to the eve of that cabin. It is the darkest dark against the lightest light within the composition. So that's the first place we go. And he's kept it very sharp in its contrast. So, uh, he obviously has used the white of the paper right there instead of white paint. He has used white paint elsewhere, and they used to call that Chinese white or body color. It's a great uh, color used a lot in the British tradition of watercolor, but it saves uh, a white that's gone you know, dark and you didn't want it to. But he doesn't use it often because he doesn't have to because he saves white so well and paints around them. Look at the, the tree and back of the cabin. Now, if he'd have given us all corners of that cabin in equal focus, that would be like a photograph, but he's much more than a photographer. So he takes the back edge of the cabin and he goes ahead and flows it into the tree. That tree was probably not there in reality, but he knew how to put it there uh, to give that thing some transition to the background by using the tree. 
So you see the, the, the latter part of the eave there, the back part of it just flows right into the pine tree. And then when it gets down to the shed roof, that is sort of a, a hide and seek thing as well, right below that. We come around to the front of the roof, and that is sort of a hide and seek too. Look how some of it is blurry and some of it is sharp. That's done by wetting the paper in places. It's called wet into wet. You put the water down first and then you drop the color in and you have a nice fuzzy edge. But he kept the areas sharp around it so we'd have a contrast. Rather than draw one continuous, draw one continuous boring line across the front of that thing, he's gonna make it dance for us. Um, think of Chinese brush paintings and how beautiful they are and sensuous because the, the brush is in motion. This is what he's doing here and showing us. It's, it's masterful. Look at the way he's uh, shown the chinking on the side. Again, that, that side with the sharp eave there, just come down and look at the boards on the side of it. And you'll see where he has delineated those by use of the black paint. And yet you come around the front side of the uh, cabin and it's all sort of murky again, isn't it? He's not gonna show you the same thing twice. He's gonna vary his language to keep it interesting. We talked about centers of interest. Obviously, first we went to the eave. Secondly, we're gonna go down where the color is. Now, he, he was very smart in the way he pulled his punches with the color. That red uh, shirt down there, of the person in the wagon. It's not too bright, but it's enough to pull us down eventually. And so that's sort of our Easter egg. We get a little dessert there. We go to another thing we didn't see. And then you make your way to those horses. Aren't they skillfully done? Because the horse, the first one in front, is the white of the paper. He painted around it. The second one, he used some of that color we're talking about, the, the body color, the Chinese white, to put in some of the head. Look at the textures up front, if you will. Everything's in motion, a lot of brushwork. You can tell the brush was moving very, very rapidly, except for the little uh, the fences along the top of that bridge. Those are put in with a brush called a rigger. It has a very, um, gosh, a lot of action to it. It bends like a sign painter's brush, and you make just one quick stroke right across for each paling in that fence. But you come down to the lower part of the painting where the creek is under the bridge. Look at that wonderful texture. Now the the way artists usually create depth in a painting is to have a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. The foreground usually is the most textured part of a painting because it's the most detailed. Texture reads as detail. It's almost like depth of field with a camera. So the texture is there, and as it goes back over the bridge, it gets softer, and when we get up to the mountains, it's totally soft and blurred. So that's what they're doing with foreground, middle ground, background. The only other thing I would draw your attention to is the shed over to the right-hand corner uh, of the painting. That shed probably wasn't there in reality, but think of what the composition would be without it. The house would take up all the attention, and so would that bridge, and you wouldn't have any other place to go. So he basically puts that there and completes a implied triangle again. Very subtle. It's not overt at all. That's what that thing is for. He wants to pull us over to the right a little bit. Now, the only other thing I'd show you, the trees behind that, they're pines up on the ridge there. They almost look like water stains, don't they? Again, that's the wet and wet technique. You put the water down first. You dump color into it. It's very soft. It runs, but he controls it expertly. He lets it dry a little bit. And there's a magical time in a watercolor where you put your head down and look at it sideways on the level with the watercolor that's wet lying flat on the table and if you see it shine a certain way you know you can still put something in like those trees but you only have just a couple of minutes to do it not even minutes excuse me you would have 15 to 30 seconds before it changes watercolor is quick decisions and he knew this and he was a master at making those decisions exactly the right time so there you go Let's go to the next one, Fran. And then this is uh, also a new one. And this one mm -hmm. is such a treat to have. Um, mm -hmm. This is St. Paul's Episcopal Church. And I'm sure everyone in Salem recognizes it. Uh, it's, it is uh, before they added that gorgeous filigree steeple. 
Um, but you still know exactly which one this is. This is an oil on canvas, 22 inches wide by 17 inches tall. This was donated from the estate of Susan Burris Wall. And this evening, I think we have her family with us. Um, Wonderful. I think uh, John Burris and Nancy Burris Pinkert, I know I've seen, and I think mm -hmm. Catherine Wall and I think Daniel Burris I may have seen. Um, they came to visit the museum, I think in February or maybe the first of March, just before everything shut down and they brought us this gorgeous, gorgeous painting. And so we have just been really excited about this, um, this depiction of St. Paul's in 1963. Um, what a great gift. Isn't it? A, it's a beauty. Absolutely. And I'll point you first to the motion in that tree to the right. Um, when artists are challenged by architectural renderings, um, they want to give it motion. They don't want, again, they don't want T-square and triangle renderings of buildings because they have no romance, they have no feeling. So Biggs very nicely comes in with that tree and has those limbs just very curvilinear, moving over. They're interrupting that part, uh, the peaked part of the roof there which is good because you don't want that thing to be totally uh, defined and that gives it more motion as well. I'd also point out that the main edge, the left edge of the bell tower is on the thirds. Now, those of you who have done photography know that photographers are always talking about the theory of thirds. Things are more interesting if they arrive on the thirds of an image. And so Biggs knew this, obviously and he gets you over there and puts that sharp edge, and that's where the light is hitting and the, and the darkness starts on the other side of it. But he puts that sharp edge right on the third. Uh, it's interesting too, he's, he's put two flagpoles there. We don't know if they were there in reality, but it doesn't really matter because they are also taking away some emphasis from that hard line on the bell tower, which can be so dominating. If you're doing that building only. You would need some other verticals just to give us some variety, and that's what he does. And I want to draw your attention back on the left-hand edge, midway on that edge, there's a red roof back there behind it all. And that red roof is redder than anything in the background would normally be. And there's a reason for that. Biggs is going against uh, atmospheric perspective, which is usually when you blue-gray things down as they move away from you to show distance because he needs us to go to the edge of the painting to make it more interesting. So he set up that cadmium red and he's uh, gone ahead and put a dot there on the side of the bell tower to echo it again. And then you see the cadmium red being worked or maybe it's a uh, quinacridone crimson perhaps being worked in the foreground figures in front of the church. And there's a gentle W shape. Remember he used that W in that other painting, there's a general W shape happening in that crowd. You have to imagine it three dimensionally and the W is laid down, but that's what's happening. He has brought diagonals into the positioning of the crowd to offset that big peaking diagonal above the sanctuary. So another bit of motion from Biggs, another bit of texture up front. That's what that fence is about there on the right hand side. He wants us to know that that's the foreground. So it's the most textured thing in the painting. Again, um, I can't say enough about Biggs. He's a pretty amazing painter. So let's go yeah. down and see. Excuse me. Hey, introduce, Fran. Excuse me. One, one last uh, thing we wanted, wanted to show you. Um, this is a portrait of Charlie Hammett. Uh, Hammett was a, a early silent movie uh, star from Salem. When he was in his 20s, he was, he was cast in a silent Western, the Copperhead serial, about a mountain man falsely accused of murder. He had to, to, uh, to, to strangle a new bad guy every week. Um, his, uh, <laughs> his career didn't <laughs> last long, um, so he, he returned to Salem and he made his living as a model, and he, he posed for, for Biggs often, uh, was uh, uh, modeled for uh, advertisements and, and illustrations. Um, and what is, uh, but, but what I also want you to see is, is our, our third new piece for this gallery, and uh, this is Walter Biggs' own easel uh, that, that we have that is now on loan uh, from Roanoke College's permanent art collections, and we are, are thrilled to have this with us. Uh, also here is uh, one of the, the paint palettes that he used. Uh, he used the turkey platter 
for a, for a paint palette. And so we're delighted to have these two material objects from his life and work. Uh, in, in the Can I say something about the easel? Go for it. Okay. Um, an easel is the most crucial thing in an artist's studio, obviously. You have to have a very robust easel if you're going to be an active painter, and that's what Biggs was. So you see down there, it's on wheels. Those wheels lock, so it will not move. You see there's a crank in the middle of it to go up and down, to raise it and lower it, depending on your need as an artist and what you're working on at the time. Obviously, if you're going to sign something, you crank it up way high to get down that right-hand corner to sign it. The canvases, think of them like drum heads. If you were a drummer, the reason the drumstick bounces off the drum head is because it has give and take. Canvases are the same way. In fact, you can flick one with your finger and you can get a tone that sounds like a drum. So basically, that thing is going to give and take with the brush. And if you're a really active painter, you're going to push and pull that thing out and back. And you need a very robust back backing for that. And that's why you need an easel that's very well built and can take some beating. Think of somebody fencing. They're going back and forth. They're making rapid moves on that canvas. Uh, and he anticipates the give of the canvas. And he knows how that works. But the only way he can anticipate exactly how it will move is if the easel never moves. So he has that thing just bolted to the floor practically. The uh, wonderful plate he uses, he set up his colors in a progression that's almost like a color wheel if you look at it, except for the earth tones, which are over to the right there. But that, that's ingenious to use a porcelain plate. I've never heard of that before, actually, but I'm sure it worked quite well. And to tell you the truth, I think Biggs was so good. He could have used, I don't know, a trash can top, you name it. He could have done it. He could have made it look good because the guy was just that good. So again, uh, I'm just honored to have been able to talk about his work a little bit. I think Biggs was an extraordinary painter and hopefully this added some insight into the construction of the paintings. All of us, I think, uh, get the narrative of the paintings. We get the storytelling and he was a master storyteller but hopefully this shed a little light into the construction of the paintings and how he was thinking of what went on beneath the actual narrative. Thank you for an amazing, awesome, excellent presentation. Well, and, uh, uh, thank you. I, I loved every minute of it too. Thank you. Uh,